Hello everyone, it's me, Aaron, and this is my favorite time of the year. It's that time of the year in which we get to explore everything spooky and scary. That time of the year in which everything just seems a little bit creepier. That time of the year in which monsters and ghosts and goblins are on every single street corner. That time of the year in which I completely screw up the algorithm on this channel by posting a whole bunch of smaller videos on topics that we don't normally cover, and thereby making it impossible for YouTube to know how to promote these videos. That's the true horror of the season. Yes, it is Thorgy Ween! <laughs> It's our annual tradition in which we celebrate everything that goes bump in the night. And this year, oh, this year I got some special stuff planned for you guys. Because this year, we're going to be starring on... Whenever it goes up. And we're going to be going for an entire... However long it lasts. All leading up to the big finale on... Whenever it gets done. Okay, 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 yeah, yeah, let's go ahead and get this out of the way right now. Uh, you might be wondering why we're starting our big marathon of spooky content on Halloween and not leading up to Halloween. Well, long story short, I had planned everything out this year for Thorgy Ween, but unfortunately that build the roster video that we did earlier this month, uh, I kind of went a little bit nuts with that one. Uh, it was only supposed to be an hour and a half long and only one part. And then it became a two-parter that was two and a half hours long. And yeah, I ended up kind of just losing an entire week of work. Oh, who could have seen that coming? Except for everybody who's followed anything on this channel. So yeah, a lot of people are probably wondering why I'm even bothering to do Thorgy Ween this year when we're that far behind schedule. But the reason is simple. I love Halloween. I love spooky games. And this is my one time of the year to really just go nuts with it and just talk about them as much as I want. And last year, we didn't get to do that. Not to get too personal here, but last year I had a couple of health problems. I spent about a week in a hospital last year. I'm fine now. I'm absolutely fine now. Nobody has to worry about anything. But I ended up spending about a week going in and out of hospitals. And because of that, yeah, we didn't get to do Thorgy Ween at all last year. So I ain't letting that happen twice. So, yes. Our Halloween content this year is starting on Halloween, and it's going into November. And I don't know how long it's going to go for, but I'll be real with you, I don't care. This video could be going up on Christmas right now, and it could all be leading up to Arbor Day of 2025. I don't care, I'm talking about spooky games this year. So I just want to thank everybody out there for just going along with it this year, and indulging my madness and this year we're all just gonna pretend like Halloween is a week-long celebration like I do every year and today we're gonna kick things off with something special because on today's video we're going to talk about a hidden gem that I've been wanting to talk about for almost 20 years now enjoy Let's go ahead and set the stage for everyone. In the early 2000s, horror games were seeing a boom. Thanks to the one-two punch of Silent Hill 2 and 3, combined with new shocking series like Fatal Frame, the PS2 had become THE console for horror games. But what happens whenever a genre becomes popular? It quickly gets oversaturated. Despite how big a handful of these releases became early on, horror still remained mostly a niche property. But everyone thought they could be the next big hit, so we saw so many titles coming out like Kuon, Manhunt, Rule of Rose, The Suffering, Obscure, Siren, A Handful of Evil Dead Games, Michigan Road to Hell, can't forget Michigan Road to Hell. Heck, even Clock Tower tried to make a comeback by pairing up with Capcom, who decided to turn the property into a magical girl action game. Well, I know what game we're talking about next year. And speaking of Capcom, that brings us to Haunting Ground. Now, as you can imagine, many of these horror games weren't selling all that well, so stores weren't ordering that many copies of them. Heck, with some of these titles, you'd be lucky if your store ordered any copies. Well, in 2005, along came Resident Evil 4, and I love the hell out of Resident Evil 4, and despite what people say, I do consider it to be a horror game that is quite scary at times. But yeah, let's be real. It was the game that made people say, sure, you can have zombies in your game. If you can suplex and roundhouse kick them. So you already had an oversaturation of these games, but then Resident Evil 4 came out and it made everyone want action horror rather than horror horror. And yeah, that kind of killed the horror game boom. 
Did I mention this game came out four months after Resident Evil 4? Yeah, even with the Capcom logo on the cover, at this point, nobody was buying this thing. So because of that, copies of this game range from expensive to HOLY CRAP! And it's because of this that Haunting Ground to this day remains one of those cult classic games that people keep asking for a re-release. Because you look around YouTube and you will see plenty of people saying that this game was a hidden gem among that sea of PlayStation 2 horror games. But no hidden gem is worth this kind of money. So, how did I get my hands on a copy? It's a mystery. Yeah, okay, I'll admit. I spent years looking for some kind of a way to play these games, but long story short, I finally just had to emulate it. And that's saying something, because if you have watched this channel, you know that I suck with computers, and I have mentioned several times in the past that I have tried to emulate games, and I have always failed. But I finally sat down and I learned how to emulate PlayStation 2 games for this video, and I have to admit, it was easier than I expected. Granted, I still ran into some technical glitches like this one, and the lighting in some scenes is off, and now I'm going to spend the rest of my life paranoid that I download a virus, but I was able to finally check this game off my bucket list. And I know some people are going to say that you shouldn't emulate games, and hey, if there is a way to officially buy the product from the company for a reasonable price, then yes, I agree with you. Here's the problem. There's no way to officially buy this game from the company for a reasonable price. The only way to actually get your hands on a legitimate copy of this game from Capcom is to get a PS3, set up a Japanese PS3 account, get some gift cards for some yen and then put that onto your account, then buy the PS2 digital classics version of the game called Demento. Which I did. Yeah, I knew this game had English voice acting, so I was hoping that there would be some kind of a way to swap the instructions to English as well, but... Sadly, no. I can understand everything everybody's saying in the game, but I can't read any of the instructions, which still makes the game kind of unplayable, so yeah, I had to emulate it. But if anyone from Capcom is watching this, I did technically buy a copy of the game from you. You still got my money, so... We cool? Is everything good? I'm gonna get kicked out of the Capcom Creators program for this, aren't I? But now that I've finally gotten to play the game, what did I think about it? Well, let's start by talking about the premise. You play as Fiona, a young girl who wakes up in a mysterious mansion after her family got into a car crash. She has no idea where she is, but as she tries to escape her gothic prison, she finds a dog named Huey, who is just the best boy. Oh my god, he's so freaking cute. Sorry. Sorry, I see a dog and I just can't help myself. But yes, yeah, she finds this dog named Huey, and he helps her in her quest. From there, the plot gets... Well, it gets pretty wild. When I was younger looking at these trailers, I thought that this was going to be a game about ghosts, but what it's actually about is more bizarre than anything I could have ever guessed. I won't spoil any of the major plot points, but let's just say that if Resident Evil is Capcom's take on American horror films with Romero-style zombies and guns and one-liners, then Haunting Ground is Capcom's take on European horror films especially Italian horror films. This is just one gouged out eyeball scene away from being a Lucio Fulci movie. And I'm not saying that as a negative, no, not at all. Italian horror films are great and I find it amazing that a big company like Capcom actually tried to do something in that style. But Italian horror films are also pretty niche. They get pretty out there and are certainly weird compared to what a lot of audiences out there are used to. And they tend to tackle a bunch of subjects that well, it's not going to sit well with everyone. Let me into your womb. I figured this year for Thor you Ween, I'd just get the entire channel demonetized right at the beginning. Just, you know, go ahead and rip that band-aid right off. In fact, this game has four possible endings, and I'll just let you know right now, one of those endings... Oh, oh, a lot of people are not going to be okay with that ending, and I can totally understand why. Whatever you do, do not get the bad ending. Avoid the bad ending at all costs. It might be the most tragic and upsetting bad ending in survival horror history. 
But it's not just the plot that matches this European horror style, it's also the aesthetic. This mansion is perfect in how it starts out as an old gothic manor, but the more you explore, the deeper the story goes and the more you learn, the more twisted it becomes until you're running through some nightmarish M.C. Escher painting. It's a slow burn and it's incredibly effective. There were many times that I walked into a new room and just said, what the hell is this? And it's pretty impressive that after multiple hours, it kept me surprised like that. And a lot of that has to do with the fixed camera angles. Yeah, you have no control over the camera, which is great because it means you'll be walking down a hall and then all of a sudden the camera will change and you'll have no idea what you just walked into. Yeah, certainly wasn't expecting that. Although one complaint I do have about these fixed camera angles and something that I never thought I would say, I wish this game had... Oh god. Alright. Here it comes. I wish this game had tank controls. I know. I'm scared too. A few years ago we played Silent Hill for the first time on this channel and I said that I found the tank controls to be easier than when I was a kid. Then two years ago we played Dino Crisis and I said the tank controls were actually pretty good. And now I'm actually asking for tank controls in a game. What the hell is happening to me? But yeah, I do feel it would have made parts of this game easier, because even though you will keep moving in whatever direction you were going when the camera angle changes, I still can't tell you how many times the camera angle changed, and I just started wobbling because my brain still told me, oh crap, we're going the wrong direction, uh, I need to change course, wait, no, we were going the right direction, now I'm going backwards, oh, now I'm in the previous area, ah, damn it. And the game looks great, as I said, this thing is almost 20 years old, but Fiona's expressions are still shockingly good. Listen, Fiona has no powers. You're not going to see her save the day by picking up the infinite rocket launcher. So 90% of this game is her just looking at something horrible and being scared by it. But for 2005, these expressions were damn impressive. But I do wish there was a little bit more to Fiona than just her looking scared. Yeah, I like Fiona's look. Capcom has always been great at making memorable designs, and she's friendly with animals, so I appreciate that. But outside of that, Fiona has no character. Which I kept thinking might be on purpose. I mean, it is a horror game, and lots of horror games do have blank characters, so that way the player can more easily put themselves in their shoes and feel the terror that they're feeling. It's an effective tool in a lot of games. But as this story goes on, yeah, it doesn't really work. This plot and the mystery of this castle revolves so heavily around Fiona and who she is and we don't ever really delve into any of that. I'm going to stay spoiler free and vague here, but there are revelations that get made about who Fiona is, stuff that would completely change a person's entire life. But we didn't really know anything about her life before these revelations, so it doesn't really mean anything. These twists and turns would have had a much bigger impact if Fiona was more of a character. I mean, heck, there is a moment where she sees a character's face, and that face is very important to Fiona. But ain't important to the audience, we don't know who that is. But where the game lacks in character, it makes up for it in the gameplay. Although just like with the story, I'll warn everyone, this gameplay isn't going to be for everyone, but I loved it. I've often said that the way to make a horror game feel effective and feel scary is to take power away from your character. Both Resident Evil and God of War have zombies, but the game where you have to search for resources is way scarier than the one where you can rip them in half with your bare hands. And Fiona has nothing. Fiona has almost no way to fight back. You can find little items here or there that you can use to stun enemies, but they are few and far between. Now, luckily there aren't many enemies in the game, only really about three. But they are persistent. All three of those enemies are nemesises. Nemesi? Nemeses? They're all Mr. X. You have this big mansion to run around inside, but you start the game with this big muscular man who wants Fiona to be his new dolly. And he starts chasing you down, and he doesn't stop chasing you down. And that was great, it really did remind me of how tense those Mr. X encounters were in Resident Evil 2. I'd be running through this mansion finding clues, trying to open up doors to create shortcuts, trying to solve puzzles, and then I would hear his music kick in and that never failed to make me start panicking. Speaking of which, the music in this game? 
Perfect. The score is amazing. Whenever you're just walking through the mansion, every single room has the exact right level of eerie tone to it. And every single one of the villains have their own unique theme that speaks to them, and they just scream, you're in danger now when you hear it. And not to spoil too much, but as I said, there's three major villains in the game, but they each do the same thing. They each just chase you down like Mr. X. And I can understand some people thinking that's too repetitive, but for me, that's just the theme of the game. It's what the entire game revolves around, so I'm fine with it. Plus, they are each different enough from one another. The first villain just runs after you and attacks, but then the second one starts closing doors after she enters a room, meaning you can't just run out of there. She has now put a roadblock in your path, and you are now trapped in a room with her, and having to open those doors does take time, allowing her to close in on you, which is such a small but smart way to raise the difficulty. Although, I wish they had made these villains about 10% less aggressive, because they don't just pop up at certain points of the story. No, they are always on the map searching for you, which is great. That's how you do this type of villain. You want them to feel like they are out there searching for you, and they could appear at any time. But once they start chasing you, they are on you. It is so hard to shake these guys, and it always reached a point where I stopped being afraid and was like, okay, seriously, let me get back to trying to solve that stupid puzzle. You can stun them with items, but as I said, they are rare, and even then, you have to nail them with it. You can't be off by an inch. If you put one of the traps on the ground, they have to walk directly on top of it for it to work, and even then, the amount of time that it takes you to plant the trap on the ground is almost the same amount of time that they're going to be stunned for. So the main way to lose these villains is to hide, and if you are a big horror game fan, then a lot of this gameplay is probably sounding familiar to you right now. Yeah, it's a game where you're constantly being chased by killers and you have to hide from them. That was basically the gameplay mechanics of the Clock Tower games. And because of that, a lot of Clock Tower fans consider this to be the unofficial final installment of the Clock Tower series, which is really ironic because Capcom did make the official final installment of the Clock Tower series, and it is so not a Clock Tower game, and then a few years later they make their own original property, and it is so a Clock Tower game. So yes, the only way to successfully escape these killers is to hide. But man, do you have to be so far ahead of them for that to work. Otherwise, Fiona's just going to look at the hiding spot and say, there's no time for that. No time for that? I'm not doing this because I decided to take a break and play hide and seek. I'm doing this to save my life. That's like saying I'm dying from an infection. There's no time for antibiotics. Fiona will only hide if she is so far away from the enemies that you've practically already escaped them. But it is still a good idea to hide anyways and wait for them to fully pass you by. So anytime that you see a desk or a bed or a dresser, make sure that you remember it. Especially because if you hide in the same spot too many times, then the enemies can actually find you. And now that hiding spot won't work ever again. Which really raises the tension because then even when I successfully hide from an enemy, I then realize, oh crap, I just burned that hiding spot. That was the only time that's ever going to work. If you're not careful, you may end up having to do major backtracking to find a safe spot again. But hey, risk and reward is what video games are all about, and survival horror games tend to have big risk. However, there is a whole other mechanic to being chased that I didn't mention, and it's one of the most standout mechanics in this game. You'll notice that there's no life bar on screen. Hell, there's no icons at all. Which I love, it's one of the reasons that you get so immersed in this game. But Fiona does have stamina, which can drain from damage or from running too much but she also has a panic meter. Yeah, the poor girl has been put through the ringer seven times over this night, she just can't take it anymore. If you get too scared, then that screen will start getting blurry and now you can't control Fiona as well. She'll start running a little bit longer than you intended for her to, like she's walking on ice, or she'll even do the classic trip at the worst possible time horror movie trope. And then if she gets really scared, she'll let out a scream and now she can't stop running. And while this sudden burst of speed can help you out in a pinch, she's still slipping and sliding all over the place and the screen gets so blurry that you can barely make out what's going on and believe me, Fiona isn't the only one panicking when that happens. And to make matters worse, Fiona doesn't just panic from being chased by the enemies, there are also these little blue lights that will make Fiona panic when they hit her and they'll also alert the enemies to where you are, making them a surprisingly big threat. You wouldn't think that something that looks like Tinkerbell would mess up your whole day, but there they are. 
And you can also panic just from seeing how messed up this mansion is. There are so many twisted macabre secrets hidden around this map, like paintings in blood, a mummified corpse lying on a couch, children burning in a stove, and if Fiona sees this, she'll freak out. Even if she's being chased by the killers, this could be the thing that pushes her over the edge. Which for some reason always remind me of that clip from The Simpsons where Homer's being chased by monsters and then... <laughs> a, a coffin! It wouldn't be my channel if I didn't shove a needless Simpsons reference in there at some point. Although there are items that can increase your stamina and reduce your panic, but just like your defensive items, you are going to have to search hard for them. But you can craft items at certain alchemic research points, and holy crap, this is easily the worst crafting system I have ever seen in a game. You have to find medallions, of which there are only a limited amount in this game, and you then have to put them into this machine. Then these orbs start spinning, and you have to hit a button to try and stop them to line up their colors. And however many colors you line up, decide what item you get. And you're probably thinking, oh, so it's all about memorizing the timing and what color shows up when. No, because that would make way too much sense. There is no pattern to how these orbs spin, and if you wait too long, then they'll just stop in a blank space. I didn't mind it too much because as I said I was emulating this game so I just made a save state before each time I tried it and as a result I actually ended up crafting one of the strongest weapons in the game completely by accident so that was kind of cool. But I can't imagine how ticked off I'd be if I put a rare medallion into this machine and it didn't line up anything. Now there's one more part of the gameplay I have yet to bring up and it's probably the thing that makes this game stand out the most. Met your canine companion Huey, who when I saw for the first time I thought yeah, this is just the dog from Resident Evil 4. It's not literally the same dog, it's just the same model. But screw it, RE4 takes place in Europe, this game takes place in Europe. Unless Capcom says otherwise, I'm saying this is what happened to that dog after the events of Resident Evil 4, and this is all in the same universe. And I'm not just saying that because tying this game to Resident Evil is the only way to convince Capcom to give us a proper re-release. Now Fiona can give Huey commands, and you can do this to solve puzzles or to search for secret items because Huey is a good boy who just wants to help. Seriously, he does stuff that makes Lassie look tame by comparison. Huey is a rock star in this game. But most importantly, when you're getting attacked or chased, Huey can run up and bite the enemy to stall them so that way you can get away. Although Huey can get hurt, so you're gonna wanna make sure that you keep a healthy supply of doggy treats around to heal him back up. By the way, maybe it's just the way that I played this game, but I found way more healing items for Huey than I found for Fiona. This game really has priority straight with who they wanted to save. And you're going to want to make sure that you keep Huey right next to you at all times, because at the beginning of this game, Huey is not going to listen to anything you say, and he's going to run off on his own whenever he feels like it. There were so many times that I needed Huey for something, and then I would turn around and I realized he hadn't been following me for like 20 minutes. Although sometimes you have no choice. Sometimes the game is going to force you two to split up, because there are moments where you have to climb up a ladder, and Huey just won't be able to join you. But when this happens, Huey will be able to meet back up with you, because the entire map is connected. However... That means he's going to have to run the long way around the mansion, and until he gets back to you, you are completely defenseless if anything happens. I always thought these moments were so genius because it's not like it's a plot point, it's not like the game goes into a cutscene where you have to say goodbye to Huey, it's just a decision that you the player have to make, realizing that if you do this, you are going to make yourself vulnerable to any enemy that shows up. But what makes Huey more than just a random companion is that like with any dog, you have to train them. When he does something good, you have to give him encouragement. And if he disobeys you, then you have to tell him no. And I remember the game promoting that Huey would actually change how he behaved based on how well you trained him, and I thought, nah, there's no way. We don't have that kind of technology yet. And okay, sure, it doesn't work as well as they advertise it, but it does actually work. By the end of the game, it was noticeable how much better Huey was behaving and how much more he was helping me. For the PS2, this was really impressive. So now that I finally got to play this game, I can say that while sure, it is not worth 500 bucks or whatever else someone is asking for it, it was a hidden gem. This game did deserve so much more attention than it got. I will admit that by today's standards, some people might think that it's a little short. I took my sweet time and it still only took me about eight hours to beat, but for a horror game, I think that's the perfect amount of time. And there's so much replay value to it. As I said, there's four possible endings, but there's also tons of unlockable artwork, so many hidden scenes and special interactions that you can find. And when you beat the game, you unlock costumes for Fiona, Huey, and even the bosses. And for Fiona? Okay, I will admit that most of her costumes are just super kinky attire that made it clear that Capcom was having way too much fun with those early 2000s jiggle physics. 
but each costume does give her a special attack, so they even changed the gameplay around. That's really cool. This was stuff that I loved about horror games from this time period, and I feel like not a lot of games today bother with this stuff. I feel like today most of these unlockables would just be paid DLC or pre-order bonuses. This was one of those things that made all those PS2 horror games really stand out, just the amount of variety to them, just the amount of unlockables in them, just the amount of replayability in them. And Haunting Ground has all of that. This game might not have sold well, but you can tell when you play it, Capcom put a lot of love into this game. Capcom really did spend their time polishing this hidden gem. So I went into this game thinking, you know what? I've been wanting to play this thing for like 20 years now, and I've had no way to do it. I've probably overblown this in my mind. There's no way it's going to be as good as I want it to be. It's probably going to be a disappointment. And no, I love the hell out of this thing. I agree with everybody out there who's been saying that this is a hidden gem from that PS2 era. And you know what? I'll go ahead and say it. This is easily now in my top 10 favorite survival horror games of all time. And I wish... I wish it had some kind of a way to live again. It doesn't need like a remake. It doesn't need like a brand new installment. Just give us a re-release. Just give us some way that we can actually buy this from you, Capcom, without having to go through some crazy means of getting just the Japanese version on the PS3 or spending $900 to get it from someone on eBay. Listen, Capcom, you've been great recently with your re-releases. Your re-releases are some of the most impressive things that you've been putting out, in my opinion. So this is my pitch to you. Put out there a Capcom horror collection. Put out there Haunting Ground, Dino Crisis, so that way people will finally leave the Exo Primal devs alone. And then put out the first three Resident Evil games, like the original versions of those games, because everybody's played the remakes of them. And they're probably curious now about how the originals played, so that would absolutely get them to go and check out this collection, and then maybe discover this brand new game that they've never even heard of. So yeah, I think that that would be great. Or you know what? I'm just gonna throw it out there. Just throwing it out there. This is a game in which you have no weapons, and you're just walking around a big spooky area as something is chasing you, and you're solving puzzles to escape. Get whoever it was that made the dollhouse area in Resident Evil Village to just remaster the whole thing. Just remake the whole thing. Or you know what? Make some kind of a spiritual successor. It doesn't even have to be a big thing. It can just be like a two or three or four hour long little puzzle game in which you're being chased by a monster in this castle and then you can sell it out there at a discount price for like 30 bucks. Not everything you do has to be a giant massive AAA game. That would work and it would be a great way to keep this game living on. It is way too early in Authority Ween for me to be this delusional. Well, thank you guys very much for checking out the first episode in this year's Authority Ween. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below about this game, about this video, about anything else that you want. Uh, just get some good spooky interactions going down there. Always happy to see people talking about horror games down in the comments. So I thank you guys very much for checking out this episode. And make sure that you click that subscribe button so that way you'll see all the rest of the content that we have planned going all however long I can keep it up as we continue Thorgy Ween. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Stay safe out there and happy Halloween. Oh, hey, uh, one last thing before I go. I just checked the camera footage and uh, my camera was showing me the wrong image the entire time. It was cutting off my shirt, which, whoa, it is a haunting ground shirt. I just want to show that off real quick. It is nice shirt of just a random blonde woman's head. So there you go. Happy Halloween.